Okay, I'm going to call the proceedings to order. People are still uh, finding their way, finding their way into the auditorium and finding the way, their way into um, our return to in-person events, uh, and uh, that will be you know, continuing, I'm sure. But um, we need to get started. So good afternoon and welcome to the second annual symposium of Good Systems. Um, we've, good Systems has been around for more than two years, but this is the first time since our um, uh, inaugural um, symposium uh, way back when that we've been able to reconvene back in this hall where many of you will remember um, you know, our exciting uh, kickoff event some years ago. I'm Sam Baker. I'm chair of the Good Systems Research Grand Challenge here at the University of Texas. Thank you for spending time with us and for joining the conversation to help shape the future of human-centered AI. As artificial intelligence is increasingly integrated into our daily lives, it's ever more important to ensure that AI is ethical and values-driven. As we launch into our exciting program here at this symposium, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce UT's Deputy Vice President for Research, Scholarship, and Creative Endeavors, Dr. Jennifer Lyon Gardner. Jennifer will tell us about UT Austin's Bridging Barriers Initiative and what we like to call Grand Challenges. Jennifer. I'll just hold my note here. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the Good Systems Annual Symposium. I'm really excited that you're here with us as we highlight the work the Grand Challenge Research Team has done over the past year um, and as we reconvene in person to celebrate everything that's been happening as they've most notably launched their six core research projects. I wanted to start by briefly telling you the origin story of the Bridging Barriers Research Grand Challenges here at UT, if you haven't heard it before. UT Austin started envisioning a Grand Challenges initiative in the spring of 2016, which was about six years ago. Um, the vision was to define ambitious yet achievable goals that leverage our university's interdisciplinary research community to address real world urgent problems. And importantly, we wanted those ambitious goals to come directly from the faculty and the researchers who would be pursuing them. So it was a completely bottom up process. Um, my office coordinated the process by asking our faculty and research community to bring us their ideas for what kinds of complex research issues they would be interested in exploring across the disciplines over the next decade. We received more than 100 concepts that from more than 800 faculty across the campus and other senior level researchers. From there, we introduced researchers who had unknowingly submitted related concepts to each other, and we asked them to work together over the spring and the summer of 2017 to converge on a shared grand challenge goal. For the group of nearly 150 researchers that's now known as the Good Systems Grand Challenge, that goal was to better understand what changes new technologies would bring, to predict how those changes will unfold, and to mitigate the unintended consequences that they could cause while still leveraging the benefits that AI can provide. We've planned for this symposium a variety of presentation formats over the next couple days that are gonna showcase for you the many different ways that scholars from all over our campus um, and also external partners are working together to pursue that goal. From my own perspective, as an executive sponsor of the Grand Challenges Initiative in the Office of the Vice President for Research Scholarship and Creative Endeavors, our goals for the Grand Challenges were to see scholars growing their scholarly networks across campus and for individual researchers to gain a new scholarly perspective from interacting with others that are far outside their home discipline. Good Systems and our other two grand challenges have definitely met those goals. And we've also seen benefits that were totally unexpected. For example, Good Systems has nucleated a very deep, multi-layered partnership with the city of Austin that paved the way to, to a master interlocal agreement between the city and UT, which is now regarded as a model town and gown partnership by a lot of other US cities. And the three grand challenge teams together have built meaningful relationships with more than 100 external stakeholder organizations. Maintaining those research relationships is likely to be one of the major legacies of the Bridging Barriers Initiative that I think will, are, is going to last long after the program formally sunsets in 2027. 
I'm now going to turn things back to Sam, who's our current chair of Good Systems and one of our professors in the Department of English, who's going to highlight for us some more of Good Systems accomplishments since its formal launch in 2019. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer, for those remarks. And thank you so much for your tremendous service to the university as a prime mover, along with Vice President for Research Dan Jaffe and former President Greg Fenvis in the founding of the Bridging Barriers Grand Challenge Program. I know I speak on behalf of the whole Good Systems Network when I say that we're tremendously grateful for your energetic and thoughtful institution building efforts. We aspire to be worthy of the faith you show and the ability of the university's faculty, staff, and student researchers to rise to meet the grand challenge you've helped us identify. The specific grand challenge Good Systems addresses is the urgent need to ensure that artificial intelligence technology will be beneficial, not detrimental, to humanity. What unintended consequences is the advent of AI bringing with it? How can AI technology and our society adapt to each other so that people are not harmed, but instead benefit from the emergence of AI? The rise of AI is an unprecedented event which demands a unified response. To properly raise and begin to answer these critical questions about AI and society, we need to hear from the whole of our university community, from social scientists, humanists, and artists, as well as from engineers, computer scientists, and scientists in other fields. We also need to hear from stakeholders in our city and in our state and from across America and the world. So as you're here today and tomorrow at this symposium to help us find the best path forward with artificial intelligence, we are listening to and collaborating with, as Jennifer described, industry partners from companies both large and small, citizens groups and concerned individuals from near and far, and governmental leaders and agencies on all scales. Over the past few years, Good Systems has sponsored dozens of research projects investigating how people and artificial intelligence can work collaboratively together for good. These were previewed at our kickoff. They were uh, showcased at our first symposium, which was online last year. And then you'll be able to read and hear about those projects now this afternoon face to face in the poster session that will follow the plenary talk we're about to hear. And tomorrow, at the Ayala Auditorium in the computer science area of campus, you'll hear about our six new core projects, the large ongoing research endeavors now unfolding at the core of our mission. Tomorrow morning, representative scholars from each core team will speak about these core research projects in the areas of disinformation, robotics, smart cities, racial justice, privacy and surveillance, and smart tools and the future of work. Then, tomorrow afternoon, our university researchers will engage with leaders from industry and government to discuss the future of AI in those areas and beyond. So we have a great two-day program ahead. You can find the full schedule and all speaker bios on our website, goodsystems.utexas.edu, or by scanning the QR code you can see around this room, which will take you directly to the symposium schedule. And now, we're honored to have Dr. Milan Tambe to here to kick us off. Dr. Milan Tambe is the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Center for Research in Computation and Society at Harvard University. He also serves as Director of AI for Social Good at Google Research India. Dr. Tambe's work focuses on advancing AI and multi-agent systems for public health, conservation, and public safety with a track record of building pioneering AI systems for social impact. His research has often paved the way for the very first uses of key multi-agent systems models and algorithms in the real world. Dr. Tambe is the recipient of numerous awards, including the International Joint Conference in AI John McCarthy Award, the Association for Computing Machinery Autonomous Agents Research Award, and from the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence the Robert S. Englemore Memorial Lecture Award, among others. For his work in AI and public safety, he has received the Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award, commendations of appreciation from the US Coast Guard, and more. We're grateful to him for traveling to speak with us today, 
And with no further ado, let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm really deeply honored. This is uh, my first trip outside of uh, Boston for a lecture since February of 2020. So uh, I'm really delighted to be here. And thank you for all, uh, really, the great generosity in how, um, you know, and, and all of your hospitality. Really glad to be here. So thank you. And the Good Systems Initiative seems to be really a fantastic initiative. I've been learning about it. Very inspiring, and I have had a very inspiring tour so far. So let me uh, now move into my lecture. So I'm going to be talking to you about the work that we've been doing in my research group for the past 15 years. We've been focused on advancing AI and multi-agent systems for social impact, focusing on topics of public health, conservation, and public safety and security. With the goal of optimizing our limited intervention resources. Let me just jump right into some of the lessons that we've learned. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. With respect to public health, we have large populations to serve, but limited number of public health resources. Concrete example is work we have done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles, where harnessing the social networks of these youth, we are able to show that our influence maximization or social network algorithms are far more effective in reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. But this work required innovation in the area of social network algorithms. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect, but limited number of ranger resources. Concrete example is work we've done in Uganda and Cambodia. We're harnessing past poaching data. We are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares. And for the past several years, have been able to remove thousands, if not tens of thousands of these snares. But this work required innovation in the area of what we call green security games, which combines machine learning and game theory. With respect to public safety, we've contributed new models called Stackelberg security games and new algorithms that have been in use by the US Coast Guard, by the US Federal Air Marshal Service, by the Los Angeles Airport Police and others. These are the very first uses of game theory for optimizing limited resources. These may seem like very different areas, but what ties them together is the underlying research area of multi-agent systems. Today's talk will focus on public health and conservation. A second lesson is that in AI for social impact, Partnerships with communities, with nonprofits is crucial. Listed below are logos of some of the nonprofits I've worked with. Our ultimate goal really is to empower these nonprofits to use AI tools and avoid being gatekeepers to AI technology for social impact. The third lesson is that this entire data to deployment pipeline is important when we think about AI for social impact. It's beyond just improving algorithms that tends to be the focus of the AI community. We start our process by immersing ourselves in the domain, trying to understand from a nonprofit what kinds of data are available, what kind of problems they really face. Following that, a predictive model may make predictions on which of the cases faced by a nonprofit are high risk versus low risk. Following that, a prescriptive algorithm may make recommendations on which of the cases to actually intervene on because we don't have enough resources to intervene on all of the IRS cases. And field testing and deployment is crucial, not only because we want to understand the limitations of our models and algorithms, but because social impact itself is a key objective of our domain, of our work. So with that introduction, let me now jump into four projects I'm, I've selected for you to present to you. Um, Three in public health, one in conservation. I'll cover papers that we have from 2017 to now on these topics. I'll focus more on the real world results. There are more details on simulations and so forth in our papers. I'll highlight the role of the key PhD student and postdocs who led the work by putting up their pictures in the top right hand corner of the slide on which their work is shown. Start here by the first topic, first project on use of restless bandit models for maternal and child care. So 
um, when I was a PhD student in Pittsburgh, there used to be these you know, documentaries on the local public uh, TV station on uh, challenges faced in India and so forth. And I would think, you know, what I'm learning in AI, could this actually be of any use there? And finally, it's arrived, so now, now I, ha I have the ability to actually hopefully contribute to that. And so I'm going to talk to you about one of the projects that we are running out of Google Research India. The rest of the projects are projects that we've been doing at Harvard. So the United Nations Sustainable Development Target says that by 2030, the maternal mortality ratio, that is mothers dying during pregnancy and childbirth, should be below 70 per 100,000 live births. Western Europe has the lowest. United States is more than double that. In fact, it's becoming worse. Um, it's, it's, been, uh, it's doubling. It has doubled in the past few years, past decade or so. But in India, you can see that the rate is much higher than the UN target for 2030. And so this is the area that we are going to focus on. And what this means is today in India, we have women dying in childbirth every 15 minutes. Four out of 10 children are too thin or short. Two children under age five die every minute. And so we are very fortunate to be working with a nonprofit called Arman, which benefits 26 million beneficiaries, mothers, that's active in 19 states in India. We are inspired by the founder of Arman, who in a very inspiring speech talked about how pregnancy is not a disease, childhood is not an ailment, Dying due to a natural life event is just not acceptable. And so the question is, okay, we are inspired, we want to do something, but what can we do with AI? And so after some discussion, we arrived at a particular problem in one of the programs that they run called M-Mitra. It's basically a weekly two-minute automated message to new or expecting mothers. It's like, you are three months into your pregnancy, you should use this health supplement. Or, your baby is three months old, enroll the baby in this government program. Arman has shown that mothers who listen to 141 of these messages that are delivered get significant benefits for their own health and the health of their babies if they listen to these messages. Up to two million mothers have enrolled in, the pro in this program. So what's the problem? Unfortunately, 30 to 40% of the women who enroll may become low listeners or drop out of the program. To understand why, we have we've, we've toured with Arman, places where they enroll these women in the hospitals, to the localities. Of course, having grown up in Mumbai, I was familiar with these localities, but going inside one of these homes and talking to the beneficiaries was quite an experience. So just for those who may not be familiar, the dem target demographic here, we have a family of four or five living in one room home that's half the size of my Harvard office and living in about $100 a month. So we can understand why these women may become low listeners or drop out of the program. So what can we do about it? Arman has a call center from where they can give service calls to these mothers to understand their complaints and try to resolve them so that they stay on in the program. But the call center is essentially a limited resource. So the question is, can we help them optimize the use of this call center? So supposing we have 100,000 beneficiaries, mothers, and we want to choose 2,000 service calls we can make so that we maximize the total number of messages that the mothers listen to. So just to make, uh, give you a very simple example, supposing we have this call center worker which has, who has five mothers in her care, and four of them, shown in red, have not listened to Arman's voice message, and one has, which is shown in, who's shown in green. Now, the health, this worker in this case, let's suppose, can make only two calls. So she may choose the first two mothers to call, which are show, shown in red, and indeed they turn to green, and in fact one more mother turns to green, so this was a good choice. Now she has to decide next week which two mothers to call. So supposing she decides the last two mothers. This turns out to be a bad choice because not only do these two mothers not turn to listening to messages, but the first two who were listening have also turned to non-listening. So we've got more red as a result of this choice. So we have this problem of a call may not change a beneficiary state. A beneficiary on the other hand may change state on their own from listening to not listening. 
yet we have to prioritize 2,000 beneficiaries per week. We solve this problem by what's called a restless bandit, where we want to choose K out of N arms per week. I'm gonna just briefly give you an intuition of how this is solved. So each mother here is modeled by what's called a markup decision problem, where a mother might be in a bad state, she has not listened to a health message, or a good state, she has listened to a health message that week. We have action to intervene, that is to call that mother via a service call or not. And there's a certain probability that the mother will transition from a bad state to good state, which is shown to be 0.2 if you don't give her a service call, and transition from bad state to good state with the probability of 0.8 if you give her a service call. So in reality, each mother being modeled by this MDP means that with 100,000 mothers, we have 100,000 such MDP arms, and we have to choose out of these 100,000, 2,000 mothers to call. Solving these problems is peace space hard, these are very hard problems to solve. So this is solved by what's called the Whittle Index. So you compute the Whittle Index for each arm, for each mother, which is essentially computing the benefit of intervention. Uh, more formally, we are trying to compute a subsidy to give to each mother, this is subsidy in comp computational terms, so that the benefit of calling and not calling becomes equal. But essentially, by computing this Whittle index with an algorithm we had developed in 2016, we are able to rank whom, which mothers to call, and then we choose the top K mothers to call. Now, usually, this Whittle index requires that all the model parameters, the transition probabilities, are known in advance. Here, we don't. But fortunately, we have past data. For each mother, we have features such as age, income, education level, et cetera, and an engagement sequence. She was not listening, she got a service call, she started listening, or you know, service call didn't change her state, et cetera. So based on this past data, we can cluster these mothers into different groups and then learn a mapping from features to clusters, which gives us her behaviors. So essentially, given a mother of certain age, income level, education level, et cetera, we can predict the probability that the service call will get her to go from a bad state to good state, for example. Then in the testing step, when a new mother shows up, given her age, income level, et cetera, we can predict the cluster she belongs to. Based on that, we can know the transition probabilities, the model parameters, the behavior, essentially, we are predicting. Based on that, we compute a Whittle index and then choose the top K mothers. This clustering compensates for lack of data. It also speeds up our computation because we are not computing Whittle index of each mother, but entire clusters at a time. All right, so all this being done, we ran a field study um, for 23,000 beneficiaries. This is the first large-scale application for restless multi and bandits in public health. So we created three groups, 7,667 with the restless bandit group, round 7,667 in the round robin group, and then there was a third group of this current standard of care. In each group, we called 225 mothers per week. So in the restless bandit group, the 225 were chosen by our Whittle index algorithm. In the round robin group, we called the first 225, then the second 225, et cetera. The current standard of care is to not give an outgoing service call at all. And now we want to know how many more health messages were listened to over the current standard of care group in each of these three groups. What we find on the x-axis here are different weeks, and on the y-axis, how many more messages are listened to. What we find here, the blue is our al algorithm group, the restless bandit group. We find that more than 600 more health messages were listened to in the restless bandit group versus the round robin group, where there's very little difference compared to the current standard of care. In terms of statistical significance, we can show that the improvement created by our algorithm is statistically significant, but in the round robin group, it is not statistically significant. The point being that optimizing these service calls is important in order to get benefits from these service calls. We are now transitioning the software to Arman. Uh, Aparna Hegde points out that we are able to reach out to more and more women each week and get them back into the fold and save lives because of AI. And there's an interview uh, of one of the mothers who got a service call with, who talks about how I will follow all the advice and take good care of my baby. There's a nice YouTube video um, on AI for social good in partnership with Arman. I recommend it. It was created by a very talented team. Um, so 
you know, you will see some of these, uh, some of these courts and the environment in which these mothers operate and so forth in there. So our goal now is to, in, by 2023, assist one million beneficiaries. So that's the target to get to in 2023. And we have begun discussions with a program called Kilkari, which is a program run by the government of India. It's India-wide. And that's 5.28 crore, that means 52 million. And so that's the volume of calls that they give. 2.5 million mothers are enrolled in the program at any time. And so that's the scale we want to get to in terms of being able to help. So there's lots of interesting research, some of it more perhaps of interest to the AI researchers in this audience. So one of the questions was, you know, do we really need this complex restless bandit algorithm? Could we do something simple? Since we had run that live test, we could collect a lot of data, and based on that, we can run simulations and show that a simpler algorithm shown here in greedy doesn't do as well as our Whittle index algorithm. There are many other challenges as well. I talked about this full data to deployment pipeline where we begin with this immersion, followed by machine learning uh, in order to basically figure out what's the right mapping of features of the mothers to her behavior. And then finally, next is this optimization step where we choose the top K mothers to call. So we first choose to maximize learning accuracy and then separately optimize by choosing the right mothers to call. So this is a stage by stage approach. However, maximizing learning accuracy does not translate into maximizing decision quality. And so I'm gonna quickly show you how, how that might be. So on the X axis here are different features, say for example, age or income. And then the Y axis is behavior, transition probability. The blue dots, which are shown to the left of that orange line of feature values, are all low-risk mothers. The red dots are all high-risk mothers. So if you're asked to do the stage-by-stage -stage learning and maximize learning accuracy using a linear regressor, you'll learn the green line because the blue dots in, are in majority and you'll be able to predict more accurately. However, that means you miss the high-risk mothers and so it leads to high learning accuracy but lower decision quality. A decision-focused learning modifies the loss function of learning to directly maximize decision quality. What this means is if you're now asked to learn a linear regressor, it learns that green line so that it is more accurate in predicting the red dots. The point being that it has lower overall learning accuracy but it's focusing on the mothers who really matter and it has a higher decision quality. We applied this idea in the context of Arman and showed that with decision-focused learning, we can achieve higher policy performance. You can see here that the decision-focused approach shown in blue has overall higher policy performance, decision quality, even though in terms of predictive accuracy, machine learning accuracy, it is actually lower. So the point here is that we got to go to what's the final product of our learning, which is to help in the final decision quality rather than obsess on the accuracy of learning itself. The same sorts of ideas are also useful in problems like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis causes half a million deaths in India per year, over three million are infected. And the TB treatment is to take these TB pills for six months. I get exhausted if I get a, you know, I have to take some pills for six days. Six months is a really long time, and so patients drop out. So, but that's problematic because it's not only that they don't get well, but now we get drug-resistant bacteria. So to deal with that, again, you have call center workers who call these patients to remind them to take their medicine every day. Now the call center worker faces a problem that she really doesn't know who has taken their medicine, who has not. So she'll call and then find out when she calls the first three that two of them took their medicine last night, one didn't. And then again, she has to choose who to call. So it's similar to the problem I showed you earlier with the mothers, except that there's the challenge of partial observability. We don't have observations of the patients. We solve this by doing two things. When an arm is not played, when a patient is not called, there is no observation about the patient. We essentially update the belief, probability that this patient has taken their medicine by saying, generally speaking, the probability will be lower when we get information, when we call a patient, uncertainty collapses. Now the patient tells us 
I took my medicine last night. As a result, now we know the state of the patient. Or I didn't take my medicine last night. We know the state of the patient. So this collapsing of uncertainty can be exploited for a fast algorithm, which we have shown uh, we can provide optimality guarantees for. And in comparing with the state of the art that this is a faster algorithm and leads to higher sol without losing a lot in solution quality. So our, our algorithm is shown in blue, running faster without losing a lot in solution quality. There's many other interesting challenges here for in AI, in terms of foundational contributions in AI, in terms of index queue learning, in terms of risk aware restless bandage and robust restless bandage. So the point about AI innovation and social impact going hand in hand is what I wish to demonstrate here. Let me now switch to the second topic that I wanted to focus on, which is social networks for HIV prevention. So this work came out of the time when I was uh, in LA at the University of Southern California, right, right outside our campus was an encampment of homeless people. And the question was, you know, you just drive by, you know, just like, okay, what can we do? Fortunately, in collaboration with the School of Social Work, they presented to us this problem of preventing HIV in youth experiencing homelessness. There's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles every night. The rates of HIV in this population is 10 times the rate of a normal house population. So homeless shelters try to run this campaign. They cannot go to all of the 6,000 youth, but they'll try to identify key peer leaders, educate them about HIV prevention, expect them to talk to their friends, their friends to talk to their friends, and information to spread in a social network. So this is real face-to-face -face interaction. This is not happening over Facebook, for example. So take this network, each node here is a homeless youth, each edge is a friendship edge between two youth. And we are trying to choose, in this case, three youth shown here, C, F, and H, to maximize the total number of youth who get informed about HIV prevention. And this is a picture from our social work colleague educating these youth in one of the executions of our program. So here information is supposed to spread with what's called an independent cascade model. So if you educate a youth C about HIV prevention, they'll inform their friend D with the probability of 0.4. D will inform their friend E with the probability of 0.4 and information will cascade in the social network in this way. Now there's been two decades of work on these algorithms in the computer science literature. But when we try to actually deploy these algorithms in the field, again, we find lots of interesting research challenges because there's a lack of data and there's a lot of uncertainty. And this is a key feature of AI for social impact. There's uncertainty in the propagation probability. I said 0.4, but we may not know that. Usually in previous work, it's assumed that if you recruit some youth, they will show up, but these are youth in difficult circumstances and they may not actually show up for these education sessions, which means we need backup plans. And so this leads to more dynamic policies. And the social network itself that is assumed to be an input is not known. So we can do a limited number of queries to uncover the social network. I'm going to very quickly sketch for you some ways in which we solve these problems. So as I mentioned previously, the assumption is that if you have a youth C, you educate them about HIV prevention, there's a known probability 0.4 that their friend D will be informed about HIV prevention. But in reality, this probability is not known. So we can say we sample it from some distribution, but the mean of the distribution itself is not known. And so we may say it lies within some interval. Now we have this problem of robust influence maximization. How do you do influence maximization when we have all this uncertainty about this propagation probability? We solve this problem as a zero sum game against nature. So we are trying to choose peer leaders to maximize influence, but nature is trying to choose parameter settings to cause our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. So we are trying to maximize but nature is trying to minimize where the payoff is the outcome of our particular choice of peer leaders compared to the optimal policy had we known nature's choices in advance. So for those who are interested in the game theoretic formulation and so forth, there's a paper that outlines all of the details, but I'm just gonna sketch for you why this is an interesting problem to think about. So if you imagine a, a network of 400 youth and we have to choose 40 youth, so that's 400 choose 40. That's a large number of different choices of peer leaders. 
Nature is trying to choose parameter settings as probabilities from a continuous interval. Nature has a lot of choices. So if you think about writing this down as a game, it's difficult to write it down in memory, let alone trying to solve it. So we solve these problems by initializing the game with a small number of strategies for the influencer and nature. And then there's this double oracle algorithm whereby you incrementally grow the game. So the influencer's oracle adds its best response, nature's oracle adds its best response, the game grows, and we iterate, and with a few iterations we converge, and we can show we converge with approximation guarantees. So this is the way in which we can solve for robust influence maximization. I'll go to the second problem. We don't know the social network in advance. We could, in theory, talk to our social work colleagues and say, hey, you sit in this homeless shelter and find out who's friends with whom and give us a map of this entire social network of these youth. But this is not possible. We can't then take this program to different cities, for example. Instead, if we can say, query 15% of these youth by saying, who are your top five friends? And based on that, if we can, having queried them, still select the top K, choose the K peer leaders for influence maximization, such that the performance of our choice of K is the same as what would be possible had we known the entire social network in advance, that's what we want. So the sampling should not cause a loss in solution quality. We developed an algorithm that achieves that where we sample nodes randomly and estimate sizes of the communities the nodes belong to and choose seeds from the largest K communities. I'm gonna skip over some of the theoretical guarantees and talk to you about an experiment we ran. Our system is called Change. It has the network sampling. It has the robust policy generation. And now we ran an experiment with 750 youth. This is done with, in collaboration of Professor Eric Rice of Social Work. There were 250 recruited in our Change arm. 250 were treated with degree centrality. This is the normal method that gets used in these drop-in centers. Call in the most popular youth. That makes sense. So change versus degree centrality and the control group 250, there is no intervention at all. And now we want to know at the end of one month and at the end of three months, was there an actual reduction in HIV risk behaviors? So we ran this study in collaboration with three drop-in centers in Los Angeles, My French Place, Los Angeles LGBT Center, and Safe Place for Youth. As far as we know, the first large-scale applications of influence maximization for public health. And we can see here uh, at the end of one month what's happening. So in terms of reduction of condomless anal sex, which is one of the HIV risk behaviors, we can see change has a large reduction, more than 30%, whereas with degree centrality and control, there is no reduction in this HIV risk behavior. In terms of at the end of three months, again, in terms of this HIV risk behavior, we can see degree centrality beginning to do better, but still not as well as change. The point being that change causes this reduction in HIV risk behavior faster is important, not only because it's a risk behavior, but also because it's a community where youth come and go, and therefore having this information out there faster is important. So our choice of which peer leaders to select is more effective than something like degree centrality, which brings in the most popular youth. We looked at other HIV risk behaviors, such as condomless vaginal sex, and again, we can see that change does better. There are statistical significance results in our papers, and here's what our col collaborator had to say about this. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. Again, there are lots of interesting new research challenges to address in terms of ensuring fairness. Uh, these are different uh, race categories and we can see that sometimes there's a difference and so fairness would ensure influence is spread across without causing disparity. There are challenges of using reinforcement learning for influence maximization, which allows us to speed up the whole process. So the third project that I wanted to highlight today is work that we did with COVID-19 that led to several of these publications, all in collaboration with our colleagues in the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Um, but I'm gonna highlight the one in Science Advances, which gets a lot of recognition in the popular news media. And so this is work that got done with Professor Michael Mina in the Chan School of Public Health. 
So when COVID hit, one of the problems that was faced is what kind of tests should we use? Should we be using the PCR gold standard test, which detects low viral concentration but has a higher cost and slower turnaround time, or rapid tests, which detect higher viral concentrations, has a lower cost, but we get back results very fast. So if you're trying to test students at Harvard, the point being that, okay, should we be using PCR for all of the students and isolating those who turn positive, or should we be using these rapid tests and isolating positive students? So to do, I mean, this was Michael's problem. To assist him, we built an agent-based simulation. So if indeed for all of the students, we can run a rapid test and these PCR tests every three days and then isolate positive individuals and we get back results instantaneously in both cases, then y-axis shows the number of infections. Rapid tests don't do as well as the PCR tests. PCR tests are better. So unfortunately, however, the PCR tests don't get us back results quickly enough. There's a one-day delay in getting back results. If there is this one-day delay, there's a one-day delay in isolating positive individuals, and that then means that the advantage of this PCR test is lost. Rapid tests are better. If indeed we can, because of cost, run these PCR tests only every five days instead of every three days, that we can run these rapid tests, again, the advantage of the PCR test is lost. The point being that rapid turnaround time and frequency is more critical than sensitivity for COVID-19 surveillance. This work got a lot of attention, uh, covered in the New York Times and Washington Post and so on and so forth. And we were honored to find one day Dr. Fauci discussing our paper on TV. Uh, that was very interesting in terms of getting a review from him. And then today, given the advocacy and all credit to Michael Mina, uh, for his advocacy of rapid tests. Rapid tests are now available uh, freely um, for the public. This is under the Biden plan. And so, whereas all credit to Michael to be pushing this rapid test, the fact that we were able to play some role in providing some kind of a modeling assistance is what we are thankful for. So it seems I have about 10 to 12 minutes left. And with that, I'm going to skip to the last project I wanted to highlight today, which is use of game theory and behavior modeling for poaching prevention. So in parks such as the Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda, there's this wonderful wildlife, but there are threats to the wildlife, snares or traps that get placed by the thousands in order to maim and kill wildlife. There's a small number of rangers, maybe in the hundreds, that are to patrol these thousands of square kilometers trying to find these traps. And you can see how difficult it must be for these rangers to find these traps. To assist them, we can imagine trying to divide up this park into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square, and then trying to predict which grid square are the high risk grid square so that the rangers can concentrate on those. We have 10 years of data from Uganda in terms of ranger patrol frequency, animal density, distance to river zones and villages for each grid square. And then based on that and past poaching incidents, we can predict the probability of snares being placed per each great square kilometer. I'm gonna skip over the details of the model we built in the interest of time, but talk to you about the actual test that we've run. The first pilot test we ran was in 2016 in the Queen Elizabeth National Park. We chose, we were asked to show the benefit of our model by choosing new areas which the rangers had infrequently patrolled. So we chose those green areas that are shown, nine square kilometers each. You can see that they don't overlap with the red dots. The red dots are where snares were found previously. So we are asking rangers to go to completely new areas and saying you're going to find snares in those areas. So the rangers patrolled these. Um, this was for a month. It just happened to be one month before a conference deadline, which meant that if they found snares, we were going to be able to write a paper. If no snares, no paper. Every day they would email us what happened initially. There were no results. Then they said they found a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. So our machine learning system was making the right predictions, guiding the rangers in the right direction, but we were too late for this elephant. Then came news that a whole elephant snare roll that's the photograph of that snare roll, 
was found and removed. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants in this area. Rangers were not patrolling the area, but we were able to find an elephant snare roll and remove it, potentially saving lives of elephants. And then whole 10 antelope snares were found and removed. Honestly, I had not anticipated this. I had asked my students for every snare found, I would buy them a free drink. And at this point, it's like, okay, we can't, we can't take your gift anymore. Following that, we had a more thorough test with three national parks, Queen Elizabeth, Murchison Falls and in Uganda, and Sripak Wildlife Sanctuary in Cambodia. In each park, we selected 24 areas. These were infrequently patrolled areas. And we predicted some of them were high-risk areas and some of them were low-risk. The point being that we don't want to say any infrequently patrolled area is a high-risk area. We want to be able to discriminate and say that some are high risk, more snares would be found, this is the prediction. Some are low risk, less snares would be found, this is our prediction. And then rangers were asked to patrol these areas for six months and come back with what they found. And indeed, where we predicted high risk, more snares were found. Where we predicted low risk, less snares were found. And so this is very encouraging. Today, our system, which is called PAWS, is getting more use. For example, in the Sripak Wildlife Sanctuary, these are pictures from snares that were found due to pause prediction. In 2018, before the use of pause, about 100 snares were found per month. After pause get, got introduced, the number of snare captures jumped more than fivefold. In March of 2021 alone, this was uh, 1,000 snares were found with the help of pause. So this has led to a lot of excitement on certainly on our part, but also on, our, on the part of our collaborators, World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, and 13 other wildlife conservation organizations. They have a collaboration a platform called SMART. This is SMART software is what gets used in national parks around the globe. PAWS is now integrated with SMART. What this means is that PAWS is now available to thousands of national parks, I mean, a thousand national parks are, uh, around the globe. And so we are really thrilled to see PAWS being tested in all these different national parks around the globe as rangers download our software and use, use it for making predictions. We are seeing its use in Belize, in Zambia, in Vietnam with these different organizations. And we are very excited to see and really glad that we can be of some assistance to the dangerous work that the rangers do by going out and trying to protect wildlife. There are, again, many interesting future challenges to work on. I mentioned this data to deployment pipeline. This, what I've talked to you about so far is prediction. Prediction of what are the poaching hotspots. But if the poachers find out that the rangers go to the hotspots, they will slightly shift and go to some different locations. So this is where game theory can assist, basically, uh, this red circle was supposed to overlap with that prescription circle, whatever, there's a little bit of misalignment, but anyhow, the point is that having made these predictions, the next step there is to solve a game whereby not only are we making predictions about the hotspots and trying to get rangers to patrol there, but anticipate what the poachers will do in reaction and therefore change, give a randomized patrol strategy to the rangers so that the poachers are faced with the randomized strategy and they can't say, well, obviously they're going to go to the hotspot. There are, so there are lots of interesting challenges here. Again, the kind of algorithms I mentioned, uh, playing the zero sum game against nature are relevant. Another collaboration with a nonprofit called Air Shepherd led us to think about the use of drones for wildlife protection. So these drones fly at night looking for hotspots. So this is infrared heat that they're looking for to detect poachers. And you can see from these images, it's not easy to detect human beings or animals from this distance when the drone is flying overhead. So we built a system called SPOT that detects these animals and poachers and delivered it to this nonprofit. And there's some interesting uh, results here, some interesting ways in which these drones can be used. So when the drone flies overhead and it fly, sees poachers entering the park, it knows that there's a certain probability there's a ranger nearby, but there's a certain probability there's no ranger nearby. So if there's no ranger nearby, what can the drone do if they see 
if the drone sees these poachers, is it can't really call the rangers to stop poaching. So what it can do is turn on the light because it's late at night and fly towards the poacher to try to deceive them to think that rangers are on their way. But if we always do this kind of deception, then the poachers will figure out. So there's some interesting work in terms of optimal deceptive signaling. So you sometimes signal when there are poachers, when there are rangers nearby, and sometimes signal when there are no rangers nearby in order to keep the adversary guessing. Other challenging areas include dealing with data scarce parks. So these are parks such as the Royal Bellum Malaysia Park where the number of observations is very low. So now we want to conduct patrol both to detect illegal activity and to improve our predictions. It's a balancing of exploration and exploitation, and we have algorithms that handle this kind of balancing. So again, lots of interesting challenges in this area as well. So we have come to almost the end of my presentation, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the lessons that we have learned. So first, as I mentioned, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. Second, partnerships with nonprofits and local communities is crucial when doing work in AI for social impact. Third, we have to look at the entire data to deployment pipeline. This work is not just about improving algorithms. Fourth, it's important to integrate these AI innovations in the normal workflow of a nonprofit. This really requires that we step out of the lab and into the field and try to understand firsthand the problems that are actually faced as opposed to cool technology that we can develop in the lab and helicopter in into the field. It's important to embrace interdisciplinary research in terms of working with social work colleagues, in terms of conservation scientists. And finally, lack of data is a norm. It's part, it should be part of our project strategy. I've certainly had students when asked to work on AI for social good, will come in and say, ah, oh, there's no data here, I can't do anything. But that is, that is the research. That's how you earn your PhD, or that's how you do your research in this field. There is no data. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you for inviting me, and I've really enjoyed your very, very warm hospitality. Thank you. So much. We'd love to um, to offer you some more hospitality in the form of uh, fascinating questions. Sure. That we're sure you'll enjoy answering. Uh, Meredith is over there. Stacy's over there with microphones. If you have a question, uh, raise your hand, and uh, a microphone will come your way. Sure, thank you very much. I'm Sharon Stover from a College of Communication, and where we've been using network analysis for a long time, but not in quite this way. So it was very interesting to see your example of network analysis. My, uh, my question, though, is a little different. It has to do with one of your recommendations about working with nonprofits. I think many of the projects that we've been involved with have reached out to governments and government officials. Uh, nonprofits may be part of the picture, but I'm. But there's. I was wondering why not in your examples. Why have you not worked with, or maybe you have, with some governments and sort of the official hierarchies uh, and authorities that one might ordinarily think are well equipped to deploy these. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, question. So certainly, when we were working with the U.S. Coast Guard or uh, the Federal Air Marshals, we were working with uh, the government uh, resources here. The problem that we face in going to, say, Uganda or Cambodia or uh, India and so on and so forth, is we find it more useful there to work directly with nonprofits rather than dealing uh, with the government. And uh, it's just more ease of operation for us. It's somewhere where it seems like they can act as intermediaries and get things done as opposed to, it seems that they have operations on the ground, they have workers on the ground, things are already working, and it's easier for us to embed ourselves in their workflow as opposed to trying to 
be ourselves as whatever, you know, Google or Harvard or something and say, okay, we are now going to come in as a separate player, separate from the nonprofit and get permission and, and so on and so forth. So um, earlier, you know, when, when we were trying to go into Uganda for this wildlife conservation, we would see people say, okay, come to Kampala City and we can have a discussion and get these, uh, you know, we can work through all the permissions and so on and so forth. But instead working as part of Wildlife Conservation Society who had already set up their network and so forth, we found to be easier to work with. But yeah, no, no uh, you know, if, if certainly working with the government is easy enough, then certainly that could work. Hi, thanks very much. It was a really interesting talk. Eric Meyer um, from the School of Information. So one of the slides you put up early on was talking about the necessity of not being a bottleneck so that other people would be able to take these lessons. And I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. Um, first of all, how the projects that you talked about are able to carry that on once you're no longer a partner you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But then also how other projects that you haven't worked with might be able to take those lessons away from what you've done. Because obviously there's a highly technical component that they may not have in their own in their own organization. So I'd like to, I'd just like to hear more about how that becomes sustainable and expandable over time. That's uh, again uh, really an excellent question. We want to make sure that the technology we develop is made in you know is made available in the public domain, made usable, made uh, explainable, made uh, I mean so that the next group of people who want to use solve a similar problem, uh, for example, for figuring out which mothers or to give service calls to, or maybe in this case, maybe it's TB patients to give calls to, or maybe there's something else um, that they can use this software, understand how it works, and they don't have to reinvent the wheel from scratch. I mean, if we can write papers and the papers are available, but that's also not so easy for people to pick up. So the goal is to really make all of this software out in the public domain, make it available. So that's part of, but the software has to be explainable, interpretable, et cetera, et cetera, so that it's not something where, yeah, it's out there, but nobody can actually use it. I don't think, I mean, I would say we haven't 100% succeeded in that. The pause software, for example, is available uh, in the public domain. Parks are downloading it and using it. So. That's one way in which we are trying to make it sustainable. And it's really a big issue of once we are done with these AI for Good projects, how can these organizations uh, keep sustaining it? So the PAWS project is the one for wildlife conservation that's been going on since 2013. And that's the one project where we're really trying to address this difficulty, whereby we've made the software available to the wildlife conservation organizations but um, trying to make sure that it keeps getting updated and it keeps getting maintained because it's not something where you give away and then it just keeps working. It's proving to be a, quite a challenge and there's a lot of lessons being learned on how to actually try to make that software be maintainable and so forth. So I don't have a, I don't have a fully well-developed answer, but it is indeed a big challenge. You build this AI software, you give it away, uh, you put it in the public domain, how do we ensure that uh, it lives on and who maintains it and who supports it? And we certainly do not wish to charge a homeless community or a wildlife conservation organization to support this kind of software. So yeah, it is, it is a challenge and uh, it's, right now we are just running it case by case. I was going to ask a version of the same question, I guess. I'm going to try to put it this way. I mean, clearly, you can't carry all the load at Harvard. <laughs> you've, you've got to export it, as you're talking about. Uh, are, are there particular NGOs or institutions that are particularly amenable to taking on this burden from you and spreading it around? So, I mean, there has been, so we've been discussing um, with the group of us. Uh, about some kind of a nonprofit or supporting some existing kind of nonprofits that exist. So there are these organizations that are springing up so uh, that try to provide some type of a service to assist in these AI for social good projects. At Google, there's some part of it that we are trying to do. 
One uh, is a matchmaking service that we, are, we offer. So, if you, so every year now we have a call where if you are an AI professor, if you are a researcher, you are interested in AI for social good, you apply. And if you're a nonprofit who wants help from some technical help, you apply. And then we run a matchmaking service. Every professor meets with three uh, nonprofits. Every nonprofit meets with three professors. And then based on the match, they'll write a proposal and we'll fund it. So we ran this in 2020 for uh, more focus on South Asia. 2021, more Africa, South Asia, but professors are drawn from around the world. I'm hopeful that 2022 will be focused here in the United States. So at least that gives us a little bit of a service whereby you know, people can start projects in AI for social good. So now the other side of it, once the project is started and something comes out of it, how, how does that project continue to move forward? How does that software continue to be maintained? So we are thinking that this cannot be, uh, certainly cannot be carried out by an individual faculty member. There has to be some type of a nonprofit organization that continues to carry on, the, carry on the work once it is shown to be successful. And so, but we haven't formed it yet, but that's the kind of thing that I'm expecting we would be able to do with potentially generous support from you know, different uh, organizations who may be interested, and, and that's the way we are hoping this would continue. But this is really one of the challenges that are faced, uh, that is faced in this area of AI for social impact. We have a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of papers Okay, fine, people need to do that. There's a lot of work where maybe there's a pilot. Okay, that's fine. And there's some less work that does a, maybe a field test, that's fine. But to go beyond that is where I think a lot of projects get stuck. And that's the bridge that if we can help people cross uh, so that software would be continuously useful, I think it would really benefit everybody a lot. And so yeah, I'm, I'm open to ideas on that front. Uh, as I said, a group of us have been talking about some sort of a nonprofit that would uh, do that kind of work uh, that employs people who just do this kind of maintenance and deployment and large scale use and so forth. But we haven't done that yet. But that's something that would be interesting to do. Quick question. Um, you have a challenge that I also have encountered when you mentioned working with uh, nonprofits, and um, I've been in many projects where I'm working with nonprofits and sometimes simultaneously with governments, and the data is messy, to say the least, or non-existent, or existing in just very bizarre ways. And I find that both uh, many times graduate students and also some in, um, who are academics are really put off by this. Do you have a particular um, methods that you have used uh, with, with people when encountering this kind of data that is either very lacking or very messy or atypical? So uh, excellent question. It is the lack of data itself becomes the pitch, you know, how people can earn their PhD. So I gave that example of a social network that was unavailable and yet you have to do find key influencers. So this you know, problem, okay, find influencers, except you don't have the social network, became the topic of PhD work of my student, Brian Wilder. And so he wrote several papers that were just focused on that. Uh, so I think we have to understand that that itself, the lack of resources in AI for social good, the beneficiaries are ones who have lack of resources. Uh, there's lack of data. And then there's lack of compute if you want to really do a lot of compute. So for the wildlife conservation organizations, you know, we could, we could write a really, really fancy algorithm that uh, uses the, you know, a large amount of compute, but they can't pay for it in terms of being able to use it. And so it's situations where you have low resources, low data, and you're trying to work for communities with low resources. And this is how you get your PhD in this field. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's where uh, you earn your PhD or that's how you do this research. So I agree with you that this is a primary challenge, but we just have to take it as a challenge and not say there's no data, so we can't do anything about this problem. Hi, very interesting talk. Um, I wonder if you could talk, I don't know if you mentioned it at the beginning of the talk or not, that was a little bit late, but 
the, the cost, the magnitude of the cost um, across the different uh, participants in this study. Um, and, and also, maybe as a side question, I'm also interested, where do you draw the line between uh, research and activism uh, and kind of try to keep, uh, keep away the team from trouble, I guess? <laughs> right, right. No, I think, uh, so I didn't completely understand the question of cost. Could you say a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the research expenditures in terms of, um, you know, um, how many researchers are involved, uh, equipment, just to, for a magnitude of uh, getting an idea of deploying these things, you know, overseas and um, the number of years, the number of um, uh, people analyzing the data, uh, just for us as scientists to understand. Sure, sure. No, I mean, uh, these are not uh, easy projects to run. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Project, I mean, 20, I, I, I mean, initially I was just emailing people in National Geographic, I mean, found the problem to be super interesting and I can go into why, but. I was emailing people in National Geographic or just sort of find who are the top kind of, you know, the, the people that gets listed there and just say, hey, I can help you, uh, and so on. And for me, some years that went by, nothing really happened. And then finally, someone in Uganda, Wildlife Conservation Society researcher said, I can help you, but you have to come to Kampala City and uh, talk to me here. So I flew to Uganda, I uh, met with him there, then he took me to a national park. Uh, and that's how that collaboration started. But until I, it seemed like, until I actually went there and showed my sincerity and really being able to meet him there and work with him there, the project couldn't get started. And then from there to getting the data was some months. From there to actually then delivering results and seeing the pilot test was, a, was some months. So it takes time. And then finally to the point where we are. So from 2013 to maybe 2019, 2020 is when they finally adopted the software. So it, it is a long drawn out project. On the other hand, there have been students who have continually benefited from the problems posed by these uh, challenges in terms of the PH rich PhD thesis that they could write. Uh, I feel that in, in terms of uh, students and so forth, certainly there is a, you know, if we are thinking about supporting them, there's a cost. But in terms of motivating students, there's a real benefit uh, because I found students to be super, super excited. If they have to say, let's go and patrol in Malaysia, uh, you know, you have people who come along, get excited by that idea. And then, you know, there's suddenly there's like ideas that come that were simply not available in the lab. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of papers are able to be written and so on and so forth. So I think. There's a lot of uh, benefit, but yeah, this is, a, this is not something um, like a traditional computer science project. Uh, also, when we are collaborating in a cross-disciplinary fashion with School of Social Work, uh, I would have my co uh, colleagues in social work get frustrated. You know, it's like uh, we gave them one algorithm to deploy before they could even start. It's like the, there's another paper. We want to improve on this. And before they could, you know, finish the study, here's two more for you to use. And so for them, because this is really a process where they're trying to engage these youth in the homeless community, they're trying to see changes in behavior over months time. Meanwhile, computer science conferences are happening one after another, uh, and people are trying to write papers and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, mismatch um, and so on. Lots of interesting uh, challenges if you think about costs and benefits and so forth uh, to think about. And the other problem of you know, research versus activism. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting and especially want to be careful with people who may get students, uh, who may get carried away and, uh, you know, take this research and, and kind of upset people by, by making their opinions known, trying to do something with this research and so on and so forth. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know, where do you draw that line? I mean, I don't know exactly what the, what the right answer is there. It probably is with the choice of each individual. But there are people who are, I mean, they, the kind of people who get involved in this have this kind of a passion for social impact in the first place. So they are there because they want to achieve that impact. And so then it becomes quite, quite a question of exactly where to, where, to con where to control it, where to draw the line. I don't have an excellent answer. I don't have a very good answer for that. That, Thank was, you. that was quite a good answer. And in the um, speaking of students, and 
in the spirit of the Grand Challenge, we have a fair number of students here, and I wanted to challenge a student to uh, raise their hand and, and pose a question for a speaker. Hi, I, I wanted to ask you about the advocacy. I saw a ton of your projects had you know call centers where you uh, called women and you know made sure they had a probability of doing something at least. And you know you met with homeless peer leaders and tried to convince them to convince their friends. And I just wanted to know if you thought advocacy was like the right way to go about doing that. I know at UT and a ton of other campuses, we just hand out condoms, like we do it for free. And so I was wondering, like, is the cost of hiring you know, like a call center person to call or, or just hiring people to go around to these homeless networks, is that better for you? And have you analyzed that to say, it, is it better to just distribute 20,000 condoms rather than <laughs> go around and uh, you know, talk to the peer leaders? Right, right. So I think um, for, the, for each of these projects, I, generally speaking, there's these domain experts who have tried lots of things, and then they have arrived at a method that works. And so we are relying on their expertise to say this is the method that works. So for example, with the mothers who are not listening to their voice messages and so forth, the domain experts, the NGO, has said, well, we've tried all you know, many different things, like just um, sending out mass text messages, for example, SMSs, and so on and so forth. And that doesn't work. We really have to talk to the mother, and then you know, there are difficulties to understand. She may say, well, there's only one phone in the family of four or five, and, and, the, and the husband has the phone, and the mother doesn't own the phone. And so the only time the phone becomes available is when the husband comes back from work, and so that's in the evening. So we have to sort of understand all of that reasoning and then figure out, okay, what's the solution? Maybe we call this mother in the evening. So they, ha I mean, that's why the service call works better, because there can be a conversation to try to understand the problem and try to solve it. In the case of uh, the peer leaders, again, the idea is that other peers will listen to their peers. They wouldn't listen to adults, and particularly these youth who have faced very difficult circumstances are distrusting of any adults giving them advice. And so coming from peers, this advice is important, and that's why this peer-led campaign, and so that's what we're relying on. So basically we are, in each case, it's the domain expert who often have tried other things who will come and say, look, this is the method that we have tested and it works, but we can make it more efficient with the use of AI. And that's what we have focused our efforts on. So one more question. Hello. Okay. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of issues with the kind of research and the topics that you've gone into. I wanted to pose another one with the AI used in the poaching and that kind of field, what's stopping poachers from getting a, a hold of that kind of research and that kind of AI and using that to determine where to put their traps and everything else? Excellent. Um, on, on terms of uh, prediction, indeed, uh, we have to be very careful in not releasing ho poaching hotspot maps and so our papers don't carry that information. Um, the software of prediction also, at best, they can read the papers and maybe reconstruct the algorithm, but they don't have input data to make predictions on you know, where these hotspots are. And then there's the game theory portion that talks about the patrols that get generated, but the assumption there is that poachers indeed have good surveillance of where the rangers are patrolling, and so that's baked into the algorithm, so it's making an assumption, the Stackelberg model, that all of our activities are visible to the poachers. And so it's making patrolling recommendations, knowing that they know where we are, and so it's using randomness rather than secrecy. So it says, you know, we know uh, the poachers are going to observe us, so we are going to randomize our presence, so all the poachers know is that the rangers will be here 60%, there 40%, but what they'll do tomorrow remains unpredictable. So it's using this kind of unpredictability as a way of trying to address uh, this problem that poachers can see the rangers and so forth. So there are these kinds of techniques that can be used to try to obfuscate our moves in order to prevent poachers from gaining insight into what we are trying to do. But we do not publish uh, these poaching hotspot maps. And you're absolutely right that if the poachers 
could come to a point where they're sophisticated enough to look at what we are doing and try and f uh, get the AI algorithm confused by you know, putting snares in the wrong places and so forth, then we would have a really a completely new problem to try to tackle. But we are not, fortunately not there yet, but we might get there because this is like a multi-billion dollar industry, this uh, poaching, and so eventually we are going to get there and uh, you know, we, need, we would need to be ahead in terms of this arms race of getting our AI algorithms to be smarter, to deal with you know, poachers trying to confuse them and so forth. Thank you so much for that uh, just wonderful keynote and for entertaining all these questions. I'm really grateful.